in New York Harbor stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky and all who see her knows she stands for liberty for you so proud to be called an American, to be named with the brave and the free. I across with my Lord raised to the sky and all who kneel there live forever as all the saved and testify. I'm so glad to be called a
Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous night o'er the ramparts we to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. Let's honor those who gave and served with a moment of silence. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's join together and sing a patriotic hymn, number 759, America the Beautiful. <laughs> Oh, beautiful for spacious sky. 
skies for amber waves of grain for purple mountains majesty above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet who stern in passion stress a thoroughfare for freedom meet across the Thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved and mercy. patriotic presentation together.
certainly today we want to remember and thank all those who served our country and have given to us the freedom that we have. But this morning, we especially want to thank those that are among our congregation. And so we're going to do that right now. In past years, we have played a song and had them come up. This year, we're just going to do a little bit differently. We have a gift that we'd like to give all those. There's a special people who always get recognized at the very end, after all the vets are up here. And I just like to flip-flop things this year. Is that OK? Right now, I would like all of our vet widows to stand. And if you're able, to come and join us here at the front. We have a gift we would like to give you this morning. All of our veteran widows, come on down. Come right on down. Come on down. Don't be ashamed. Come right down. Let's honor them. If you ladies just, if you want to come right over here. And, and, and face the congregation. We have, a, we have a gift for you over here, all of you veteran widows. Tell you what, why don't we remain seated this morning until everybody is at the front, and then we'll honor everyone with a standing ovation. Uh, Rachel, I believe we have one or two that can't make it to the front. Do we want to get a gift to them right now? Those that are standing. All right. And now let's have all those who served in the U.S. Army come and stand before us. Let's honor them. We have a gift for them also. Stanley Hall, did you serve in the US Army? It is a delight to have you back among us this morning. Welcome. As Stanley makes his way to join his comrades up here, let's honor any who served in the U.S. Coast Guard. Is there any of those present today? Okay, let's honor those who served in the U.S. Air Force this morning. Would you just scoot down a little bit and make room for the Air Force? I know you're, you're hard pressed to do that. But uh, we are going to honor them today, too. Now let's honor those who served in the US Navy. Are there any of those present? Come on down, Brother Daniel, Brother Tom. We have a gift for you this morning. And finally, last but certainly not least, they would say, let's honor those who served in the U.S. Marines. And now let's give a resounding applause and standing ovation to all those who served and sacrificed for our freedom this morning. Thank you to all of you. We appreciate what you sacrificed and what you gave. We honor you today. You may return to your seats. Thank you so much for allowing us to take time out of the service to do that this morning. 
uh, we believe that it is important and well-deserved for us to do that. And so, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to briefly go over a few announcements this morning as we, can, as we conclude this portion of the service and move on. Tomorrow evening, we are having a missionary night here at the church. You say, what? A missionary night on Monday night? Well, guess what? The kids on the block are doing new things these days, okay? Missionary night. <laughs> All the NMI board members are looking at me funny. We're going to have missionary night on Monday night. It's tomorrow. And uh, if you and your family are planning to attend, we would really like you to sign up today at the Welcome Center. There's a sign-up sheet. Put how many is attending in your family. Um, we just need to know a number very soon uh, to make sure that there's adequate food accommodations for tomorrow night. And so if you will sign up, we will be very grateful. Uh, ben and Hannah Ponder and their children, missionaries to Serbia, are going to be with us tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to start serving supper about 5 o'clock if you want to come. I understand some cannot come at 5, but you have to come a little later. That's, that's all right. We'll try and keep the food hot and you can come. And somewhere along the way in the evening, once we think everyone's there, uh, the Ponders will give a presentation and tell us about the work that God is helping them to do uh, in Eurasia. And uh, we are very excited about them coming and excited to see some young missionaries on the field. So you don't want to miss it. It's an event for the whole family. It's down in the fellowship hall. And so park on the lower level and enter in there. And again, starting serving at 5 o'clock. One week from today, we will celebrate Thanksgiving together as a church family. We're going to have Thanksgiving dinner. And so if there's uh, some who have not yet signed up to bring food, there is a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center this morning. Um, I think there's still some slots for green beans. <laughs> if you weren't here last Sunday, you won't get that, but that's all right. We really want everyone to feel welcome to come and join us for lunch that day. Uh, because we value it so much and think that there's a, a good place for fellowship and visiting with one another, uh, we have canceled the Sunday evening service so you can stay and visit as long as you want uh, until they yank the chair out from underneath you to put it back on the rack to put it in the room, okay? So that's next Sunday, and we really want everyone to come. Uh, bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring your enemies, and bring your mother-in-law, okay? We're going to have lunch together next Sunday. But yes, see the Welcome Center if uh, you want to sign up to bring something. The other thing that I want to let you know about is not in the bulletin yet. Uh, I just failed to put it in there. I apologize for that. The Saturday after Thanksgiving is Saturday the 25th, and we are going to decorate the church for Christmas that morning. Now, all of my handbell practice people are throwing up red flags because they know we're supposed to practice handbells that day, okay? Handbell ringers, we're going to practice at 9 o'clock, okay? And then we're going we're to decorate the church at 10 o'clock, okay? So you'll be there with bells on. <laughs> handbells at 9 Decorate the church at 10. Again, bring your whole families. We'll, we'll throw some Christmas music on in here. The big tree will go up, all the decorations everywhere, and the lights and the garlands, and it's going to be a fun event. So everyone is welcome at that. Again, that's the Saturday after Thanksgiving. There's other announcements in your bulletin, and I would encourage you to look at those and be aware of what's happening. Uh, right now, Pastor Sweezy, come and open our service for us. Thank you. Let's stand and join together in prayer. Father, thank you for the many vets and for the widows and widowers of vets in this church. Would you please put your hand upon them and touch each one and lift them up and bless them, Lord. As we worship here together, may they sense your divine presence. Lord, we pray together for Israel. We pray for your protection upon the Jews and for the peace of Jerusalem. And we're praying, dear God, that you would bring confusion to their enemies and to correct the foolishness of those who storm our streets and yell out the most disgusting racist things about Jews. Return to them, Lord, that which they have earned. We pray, Lord, you would help us to do what we can to encourage all the Jews around us to lift them up in prayer and in our heart 
and in the things that we say and the things that we do. Oh God, we're praying for your peace to settle on America and for some sign of some semblance of sanity to return and to replace the insanity that we see among the four and, and those who follow them. God, we know that you have chosen to love your people and to bless them and to bless those who bless them and to curse those who curse them. Lord, we want to be on the side of Judah and we want to stand with them in this hour. And we're praying for protection from their evil enemies. And we pray for the lives of Israel's soldiers. Many of us have served in the military and we pray that as they serve in the military, many of them volunteers, oh God, keep them safe and protect them as they do what they have to do to make their country a safe place again. Oh God, can you bring leadership to America and peace here and a sense of safety and sense. And we're believing, dear God, that you will do that. We pray that this service would be one that is crowned with your presence and the confidence that comes from you walking among your people and the strength that comes from hearing your word. God, we pray for that blessing and believe you will give it by the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. We can rejoice. He is the King. Let's sing together. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your He took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. seated let's continue worshiping together with hymn number 268 our God reigns we can have confidence today that the Lord is on the throne he is ruling and reigning supremely and because that is so not much else matters praise God let's sing and worship how lovely on the mountains are the feet of me
that we should be. Drawn to Him, He was despised, and we took no account of Him, yet now He changest not thy compassions they fail not as thou hast been thou forever wilt be great is thy faithfulness I'm thankful that's the character of the God who is reigning this morning he is unchanging because he's unchanging he's trustworthy 
We've studied his character all our lives, haven't we? We've known his character. We've experienced the way that he's been faithful to us. The hardships in your life that he's held your hand or held you through. The difficulties that you've faced in your families, God has held you through. Held you together, perhaps. Perhaps there's been financial things, relational things, employment things. God has been faithful. And I'm thankful this morning for the reality that the ruling and reigning God is not just that, but he is also a personal God. He loved humanity so much that he sent his son because he's relational, because he wanted to be in relationship with the creation that he had created. And it's wonderful, isn't it? To know and love the Savior, to have unbarred access to the throne of God, to bring our requests before him, to bring our hurts before him, and sometimes just to weep in his presence. And this faithful God comforts us even in that place. That's the God that we're coming to this morning when we unite our hearts and pray. Brother Rob Ferris, I would like for you to come after this chorus and lead the congregation in prayer before our Father this morning. Let's sing this chorus together and then let's pray. He is Lord. He stand together as we sing the chorus again. For he is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he through my mind last 24 hours if you asked 10 Christians or greeted 10 Christians and said good morning how are you maybe two would say I am blessed I am blessed today because of because he is Lord I am blessed today to be an American I'm blessed today that somewhere a soldier fought and gave his life that I'd have the freedom to be here to worship Jesus Christ, that I could choose how, when, and where. I am so thankful that I'm not only an American, but first and foremost, I am Christian. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you and we give you praise and glory. Because you are Lord Jesus Christ, you are Lord of our lives. You died, you was raised to new life, and Lord, because of your blood shed, we have life. We have life in you. And Lord, we have these freedoms that we can come and worship you. And we thank you that, that somewhere, somehow, soldiers fought and died. Soldiers fought and lived as well to make sure we keep that freedom. That we still can walk into a church on Sunday. 
greet one another in Jesus' name. Openly say we are blessed because of Jesus. Openly say that Jesus is Lord. And Lord, today we realize some take that for granted. But Lord, we don't want to today. We want to know that, uh, that it's because of your blood, because of your love for us. Lord, that you've opened that opportunity that we can have this new life. I thank you. Thirty-some years ago, I received new life. And it's still new today because every day your mercies are new. Every day you show us your love and your grace and you show us your power that you can help us to be overcomers, that we can overcome in Christ Jesus, that that we can put aside all the things that happen around us and we can still say, Jesus is Lord. We love you, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you for church family that comes together to worship you, comes together to encourage, to to, uh, promote the word of God, to say, thus saith the Lord. And Lord, that we are able to speak into one another's lives and help each other see that Jesus is alive and at work. Today, we know there are family members of the church who who are not able to be with us. We pray that you'll bless them, that you'll encourage them. Some, Some may need a healing touch, and I'm sure they do. And Lord, we pray that you will help them to reach out their hand to you and say, Lord, touch me, help me today. Some in this room are fighting things such as cancer and heart disease and and different things that we don't know about, but Lord, you do. We ask that you'll reach out to them in favor, showing them your favor, showing them your love and your grace. Lord, we thank you when we see different ones who who give praise in spite of everything that's going on, loving Jesus, loving his family. Lord, we pray now that you'll bless in the remainder of this service. We pray that you'll bless our pastor and use him in a very special way. Use use his words that you have laid upon his heart, Lord, to speak to our hearts. Lord, to help us to see Jesus is Lord. And bless this special music and encourage each one as we leave from here today, Lord, to give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen.
Truly the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. It says surely. It means without a doubt. There is no mistaking that God is here. And it's my personal belief that God has you here for a purpose this morning. Let's be attuned to God's voice as our pastor brings God's word today. So tomorrow night we're having the missionary here to speak to us, and we're having supper kind of early, around 5 o'clock. Is, is that right, missionary president? That is correct? Hmm. So we're having church tomorrow night. I'm just trying to figure this all out. Folks, uh, since we're having church tomorrow night, should we have church tonight? Hello? Anybody there? Shall we go ahead with service tonight? Okay, good. That way I don't have to throw away a sermon I've written. Looking forward to having a missionary with us. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 40. I want to begin reading at verse 21. I have decided what I'm going to bring to the uh, Thanksgiving dinner. I saw it on TV. And it, I just thought, yeah, I'm going to go find that and buy it and bring it to the dinner because it's the perfect thing to have at our Thanksgiving dinner. One of the local... Um, ice cream makers is advertising on TV a, a big, beautiful, perfectly cooked turkey, which is actually completely made out of ice cream. <laughs> and don't you just want to be in that line, get a big leg off of that guy? So I'm going to see if I can find who's doing that and buy that and make sure that that turkey comes to this dinner with us. So uh, we'll, we'll thoroughly enjoy it. I do that because my father made ice cream for 32 years, and I love ice cream. Well, let's stand together. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 21. Do 
Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Yeah. Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and he spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and he reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, and he will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Father, bless your word and our ears to hear it, our hearts to feel it, and please, Lord, our minds to understand it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, good. Somebody who will undoubtedly be at the front of that line in front of that turkey. I'll be second. Don't tell Kay she likes dessert, so just don't tell her. Well, today's Veterans Day, and it's the time to honor veterans who have served in the armed services and their widows and widowers. Do you know how many people in this country have served in the armed services? Would it surprise you to find out that only 7% of all who enjoy liberty have worn the uniform of one of the branches of service? to keep this country free, only 7%. They have by their sacrifices purchased the blanket of freedom that covers us when we sleep. And I think it's right we should reflect upon the acts of valor that have been committed in our defense and honor those who have done those things. Listen, I have been in the military. It doesn't matter where you serve. None of it is easy. Not any of it. But I want to talk about one of the last living recipients of the Congressional Medal of Honor. He is Sergeant First Class Sammy L. Davis, lives not far from here, over there near Dayton. Sergeant Davis' outfit was overrun in the Republic of South Vietnam in the Mekong Delta. When they were located on an island, the enemy surrounded them on both sides of that island and were trying to cross the river on both sides and overwhelm their outfit. They were firing large cannons. I don't know if you know much about cannons, but the 105 howitzer is a big gun, and it shoots big shells. The enemy was close, and they were firing at them, and so they loaded those guns with beehive rounds. Do you know what a beehive round is? It's, a, it's a, a shaped round that has very carefully made frechettes in it that sort of look like little darts. There are 8,000 darts in each round in the 105. And they lowered those guns and pointed them directly at the enemy. 
when they were charging and pulled the lanyard and all the men in front of them pretty much evaporated because of 8,000 darts being thrown out in all directions and killed. Sammy was one of the guys loading and firing one of those weapons. It started to rain and it was getting dark and the enemy was so close they were firing these beehive rounds one after another and the enemy, after it got dark, zeroed in on where they were by the flash of their cannons and started sending mortars in. One of them knocked Sammy off of his feet and made him a little unconscious. And just as he woke up and began to look around, he began to say, Lord, help me get up. I, I, I can't get up and I've got to fire this gun. Somehow he managed to get up and reloaded the gun, but just as he got up and reloaded the gun, a mortar round hit one of the cannons behind him. The barrel dropped down and a man who was there was blown off his feet but had the lanyard in his hand and the gun went off behind Sammy. 30 of those 8,000 rounds hit him in the back and in the hips and his flak jacket helped stop some of the ones that hit him in the back but the pressure of it hitting him shattered some of his ribs and broke his back. When he woke up from the shock of that, and started crawling along the ground to get out of the way so that he could get out of the, the way of that cannon that was firing behind him. He, he was hoping to get maybe over to where his tent was and the enemy kept charging, trying to, to come over the river and overwhelm everyone. And he looked up and he saw on one side of the river just across from the island, a man waving a little white shirt and yelling, don't shoot me, I'm an American, help me. Help me, I'm wounded. And he fell down in the grass. And Sammy said, God, what can I do? I don't have any strength. And I'm wounded. At that time, while he was praying, one of the enemy shot him in the leg with an uh, AK-47. What can I do for that man? There's nothing I can do to save him. And he looked toward his tent, and there was a rubber inflated mat that he used to sleep on. He crawled over to that mat and dragged it down the river and climbed up on it and paddled it across the river and began crawling on the bank trying to find that wounded soldier. He fell down into a hole, and in that hole he found it was a foxhole. There was not only that wounded soldier but two other wounded Americans. God help me, I, I don't have the strength to drag all these men out of here. But I can't leave them here. And one by one, he worked hard and got all three of them out of that foxhole and dragged them down to the edge of the river. And making two trips with that rubble raft, he was able to lay those other guys on the side of the raft and paddle and he got all three of them to the other side and saved their lives. His ribs were crushed. His back was broke. And he was shot in the right thigh by an AK-47. During his time in Vietnam, he earned a silver star, a purple heart, a good conduct medal, National Defense Service Medal, Vietnam Service Medal, Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal, a Presidential Unit Citation, and a Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Cross Unit Citation. And when he got home and recovered, he was promoted from Sergeant First Class to Second Lieutenant. And as he began to recover and was able to walk around again, he was invited to Washington, D.C., where the president was going to personally award him the Congressional Medal of Honor. Many of you have seen the videotape of Sammy receiving his Congressional Medal of Honor. I know that you have seen it. You just don't know that you have seen it. You see, what happened when they were doing the film about Forrest Gump, they took the... the 
the videotape of Sammy Davis getting his Congressional Medal of Honor and superimposed the, the face of the actor who played Forrest Gump over Sammy's face. And if you look hard, that uniform doesn't match up to, <laughs> to Forrest Gump's uniform. And all the men who he knew in the military and in his unit realized immediately that that was the service they had attended and watched him get the Congressional Medal of Honor and that these people had just superimposed that, that face of Tom Hanks over top of his face. So when he got back to his unit, everybody started referring to him as the real Forrest Gump. And the other guy was just a phony. He said he learned this in the Republic of South Vietnam. To love God, to call out to God in times of trouble. When it seemed like there was no salvation, and no help. To believe God that he will save you somehow in time. And he said, most I learned to love my fellow man. Great lessons. This scripture is a promise. And it also explains why we need the promise. Look at verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? You know, God doesn't see what's going on in my life. If he's a loving God, doesn't he see what's going on? Why doesn't he step forward and do something about this? Have you ever heard anybody say that? Ever had that idea cross your mind sometimes? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my cause is disregarded by God. Not only is God not paying attention to my situation, but he isn't concerned about it at all. He totally disregards what's happening in my life. Don't ever let anybody say that to you. Because they're speaking for the devil and not for God. My cause has been disregarded by God. Listen to Isaiah. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, and he will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. Listen to me. I know that some of the things that are happening in your life you feel are dragging you down. You find a difficulty sometimes just getting up to another day and going out and facing the problems that you have to face out in the city and on the job and the way things are going in your life. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But he increases the power of the weak, it says in verse 29. He will give us the strength Lord, how am I going to get up off the ground and help that man on the other side, Sammy asked. And God answered him. <laughs> and reminded him of that rubber mat there laying in his, in his tent. I don't know if you've ever seen those blown up rubber mats. I've slept on them before. They're not very big. They're not very comfortable. And I sure wouldn't want to go to sea on one. But imagine laying in the middle of one, crossways across it, and two guys laying on either side of you, and you're paddling trying to get the three of you across the Mekong Delta in the rain while you're being fired at by the enemy. Maybe even some rounds from your side are passing by your head. Where did he get the strength to make two trips over and two trips back and brought three people back? But the fact is he did. And before he left the army, he was promoted again to first lieutenant. He lives in Dayton and 
he goes around and speaks at high schools around the area and talks to them about how God has given him strength. And they love for him to come and talk to them about what the Lord did for him in Vietnam. I think we need to understand what the scripture is saying here. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Folks, I think sometimes we read words like that and we get a little confused. It says there, those who hope in the Lord will renew. That word hope is actually translated trust. To have confidence in. To believe in the upcoming blessing of God. Do you believe that, that there's a blessing of God that's coming your way? Do you trust in the Lord to meet your need? To, to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can think or ask? Because these sort of things are promised to us as the children of God. And we need to have confidence in our Lord to see our misery and understand what's going and to act in our behalf. Young men stumble, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Their strength is going to be renewed. Have you ever seen God do those kind of things? <laughs> I had a, a, a friend, much older than, than me, and uh, he was a pastor in West Virginia. In fact, around the area of the city of Parkersburg, West Virginia, in various parts out in the country and in the city, he had planted five churches. He went uh, to a neighborhood, which I used to work in when I was a bus pastor for my church, and he started the Church of the Nazarene in a garage across the street from a great big cemetery and a little house. And he worked in a factory and made money to pay for the house and pay for the property and pay for the garage and to, to glorify the garage and turn it into a kind of a place where people would come and worship. And he went around and worked with people in the neighborhood. He was a great personal evangelist. You know what his problem was? He had a horrifying speech impediment. And I, I have heard him preach many times, but I have to tell you, I had to strain to understand what in the world is he saying. It was that confusing. He was born that way. He worked hard and he built that church and there was a hundred in attendance. They bought ground on the side of the street where the cemetery was, not in the cemetery but off to the side. And he went over there with a the shovel and dug a, a basement by hand. Where's Les? Hello Les? You kind of identify with that, don't you? He dug the whole basement out himself by hand with a shovel. He, he put up concrete blocks. He, he poured the, the concrete for the, for the basement and closed in the roof of that basement and he had a basement church over there. And it began to grow. And then he decided we need to have a second floor. And so he began tearing off the roof and he ran the blocks up another floor and, and uh, laid red brick along the side of it and put on the roof, did all the electrical work and the plumbing himself. Hey, they had bathrooms. Wow. Now they didn't have to go across the street to his house anymore. And he built that church and he won 100 people to the Lord and he took in 100 members into that church. And great things were happening for him. And then it came time for election and they voted him out because he had that speech impediment. They thought a church with 100 people in it ought at least have a pastor who can speak plainly. And so the district superintendent visited with him and said, well, brother, what, what, do, you, uh, what do you want to do? And he said, well, do you have another church for me to pastor? No, I really don't because the truth is the same reason these guys voted you out I can't get another church to accept you as a pastor. You've got a speech impediment. <laughs> well, where do you want one? <laughs> there was a little town called Williamstown. 
Well, Williamstown would be nice. He signed over his house for a parsonage and the property that it was on and the property that the church was on and the church building to the Church of the Nazarene and he moved to Williamstown. And he built a church there. Pretty much the same way he built that one. That church that he built, that first one, was the mother of the church that I got saved in. Parkersburg First Church of the Nazarene. That property was later sold and then out on 19th Street, a big, beautiful church was built. But he went to Williamstown and he started again with nobody. But after a while, he got a congregation going and attendance was going up. And uh, when the attendance got rather strong, they voted him out. He signed over his house and signed over the church and the properties to the church for a new pastor to come in and pastor that congregation. Went to see the district superintendent and he said, well, you've been voted out of two churches because of that speech impediment. What makes you think I can put you in another one? Now remember, I'm not talking about RDS. RDS is a decent guy. <laughs> I mean, really, he's a pastor's pastor. Where do you want a church? Well, he named another little town outside of Parkersburg, and he went out there, and he did the same thing. He built the third church he built there. And before they could take a vote, he resigned. <laughs> He did. Turned the property and the house and everything over to the congregation and went to see the DS and said, is there a church that's a vacant? And he said, well, I have some vacant churches, but they won't accept you as a pastor because you have a speech impediment. And he said, well, uh, have you got another place? He said, no, I, I can't think of another place. And he said, well, I know a place. And he went, went across the little Canola River from Parkersburg and, and, and built, a, built a church up there on the hill. He built five churches. After he built that church, he resigned before they voted on him, and he went across the river to Belpre, Ohio. And he was walking down the street one day, and he said, I've got this garage by my house. I want to start a church in it. And he just started stopping and talking to people. And one day he ran into my wife's mother, who was pushing her twins in a cart. And he looked down and talked to them and scared them because of his speech impediment and said to her, woman, you need to have those kids in church. And, and talking to her that day, he convinced her to come and join the, the fledgling Nazarene church in Belpre, Ohio. And my wife and her father and mother and his twin brother attended that church. And after he had that church in pretty strong condition, he resigned and turned it over and turned over the property. Five churches. Then he became very ill. He got cancer. And it looked like he was going to die. By the time he got cancer, I was already an older teenager. And my pastor, John Hayes Sr., the pastor then of the first church, you know, the one he had dug out with a shovel, he was the pastor of that church, and uh, he called Brother Hay up one day and said, Brother Hay, would you, would you take me fishing one more time? I've been so busy, and I really haven't had time to fish, and I, I would like to, to fish one more time, but I, ca I can't get there. And so he said, well, I'd be proud to take you fishing. Where do you want to go? He said, I want to fish right in the Ohio River. Okay, brother. So he found a little road going down by the river and helped him out and got him down to the bank and set everything up and helped him get the lines out. And uh, he was sitting there watching his poles and fishing and they were talking about the Bible and talking about the Lord. And he caught a few fish and finally he said, John, I'm, I'm, I'm tired now. I have to go back home. I feel like, honestly, I'm going to die. And so he took him home, helped him into bed. said, John, before you leave, I want you to promise to come and hold my funeral. Okay, I'll do that. But before Brother Keezer died, 
this district called John Hay to be the district superintendent. And so he moved from Parkersburg and came out here, and he lost track of him. I came out here not long after that to pastor the Nora Church of the Nazarene, which we combined with the Carmel Church. And I heard through the grapevine that the Brother Kieser had died, which was not unexpected. I'm sorry. And went back to uh, West Virginia for a brief meeting. And uh, I had a new couple that had come into my church in, in Carmel. And uh, they were both excellent singers. I don't remember their first names, but their last name was Blizzard. Any of you hear the Blizzards, the singers? Let me tell you why Brother Blizzard is famous. He went into a Dairy Queen one day and they were mixing up some ice cream. <laughs> and he said, what are you going to do with all those broken cookies? And they said, well, we're just going to throw them out. Don't throw them out. They're, they're good. Well, what do you want me to do with them? He said, dump them in that big glass and fill it up with ice cream and then just stir it all up. That'd be great. And so he had Oreos and ice cream and he was eating it. He was loving it. And the manager came out and saw what was going on. He said, well, are you going to charge me for this? He said, oh, I'm not going to charge you anything. You came up with the idea. It saves us from throwing cookies away and we can make some money off of this. We need to call this new concoction something. Yeah. The Dairy Queen Blizzard. He has a card he carries in his pocket that says, this is the man who invented the Dairy Queen, and this entitles him to free food at any Dairy Queen in the United States for the rest of his life. <laughs> well, Brother Blizzard and his wife were going back to sing in that last church that had been built by that pastor. And I thought, well, I'm going to be there on vacation too. I'd like to come up and hear you guys sing, and I did. And then I heard the pastor preach. The church was filled. And there was a little old man sitting up in the front. And every once in a while, the pastor would say something. And he would go, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, glory to God. But he had a speech impediment. And I said to my wife, you know who he sounds like? He sounds like Reverend Kieser. She said, he's been dead for years. And I said, yeah, I know. But he just kept saying that. And I, I finally, after the service was over, went up to shake hands with the guy and talk to him. And guess who it was? It was Reverend Kieser. And I really didn't want to say it, but you know, I couldn't help stop myself from saying it. I thought you were dead. <laughs> he looked at me and said, a lot of people have wished that. <laughs> I said, no, I, I really hear, heard you died of cancer. And he said, I was dying. In fact, I was ready for Brother Hay to hold my funeral when he left town to become a district superintendent. And I was kind of upset about that. But I was in my bed praying one night. And, and the Lord told me, I woke up in the morning, and the Lord told me to get up out of breakfast, or get up out of bed and have a nice, healthy breakfast. So he called his wife. He hadn't eaten for several days. He called his wife and said, the Lord told me to get up out of bed and have a nice healthy breakfast. He also told me to have you cook it. <laughs> <laughs> Women, would you go for that? <laughs> she fixed him eggs and bacon. And, you know, a West Virginia breakfast, you got to have a certain amount of gravy and, you know, got to have biscuits and there's other things. And so she had this big breakfast and he sat up and ate this big breakfast. And she said, what are you going to do now? He said, I'm going back in the bathroom and get cleaned up and shave, and then I'm going to take you to town. And they went to town and walked around town all day. And he said, the Lord just renewed my strength. And I've been going out preaching in some of these churches. They've been inviting me to come and talk to them about how the Lord touched me and saved me and, and, and brought me through this. 
Reverend Kieser was the best personal evangelism and the most mistreated man I ever met in my life. But he never let that get him down. He wasn't like these Jews who are complaining here in the book of Isaiah. You just don't even see my situation. You don't. Listen, I know sometimes people don't treat you the way you deserve. But God does. He loves you. He cares about you. And he will lift you up. Listen to the promise that he gives us here. It's a powerful promise. Even the youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. It empowers us. And you will soar on wings like eagles. And you'll run and not grow weary. And you'll walk and not faint. Listen, let me tell you something. When you put your hope in God and trust him as your saving Lord, he'll find a way to lift you up and to use you for his glory, even when the whole world seems to be standing on your neck. We need to have confidence in God and not let the devil or the world discourage us. I am so heartbroken listening to my fellow Americans filling up the streets of the big cities and saying the most awful kinds of things, racist kind of things about Jews. Have we all turned into the Ku Klux Klan? Is, is, the, is the whole country gone crazy? And I, I think what we have to do is instead of giving up, we have to stand up for what's right, and we have to trust God to give us power and strength to stand against this kind of stuff and to speak out against it. But listen to me, folks. Don't let anybody stand on your tomorrow. Hope has to do with what God's going to bring about in your life. Hope is tomorrow. It's about what God's about to do in your life. Don't you have hope in God? Goodness. I saw a TV show. Yeah, I think it was called The History of God. But they were sitting on the Temple Mount talking about a lot of things about the temple. And as I looked around that temple, I realized, you know, we're not far away from the temple being rebuilt. And I don't think we're far away from other big end times things happening. Little things are happening all around the edges. And those will add up to the big things. Folks, we have a promise from God. Jesus sent those two angels to say to the apostles, why are you standing here looking up to heaven? The same Lord you've seen taken up to heaven will in like manner come back. And didn't he say that, that, that you don't need to be afraid, be concerned, that I'm coming back for you? Didn't he really say that? That he is going to prepare a place for us and if he goes to prepare a place for us, he's going to come again and receive us to himself that where he is, there we will be also. We need to know that there are promises and, and they fill us with hope and the disagreeable things that are going on around us are nothing in comparison to what God's planning for us. And we need to live as victorious people and not people under the thumb of some bureaucrat, some tyrant. We're not. We're the children of God. And we need to understand that and live like it. Let's stand together. God, would you put your hand upon people who are suffering now in this room, who have things that are going on in their life that are really, really causing them distress and, and making it difficult for them to sleep and difficult to eat and to think clearly about what they need to be doing tomorrow because they're so distressed. Oh, God, lift the hand of the devil off of them and help them to have their confidence renewed in you. Fill them, Lord, with your peace and a vision of what your tomorrow for them really is going to be. And God will glorify you for how you take the frown off their face and put a smile there in place of it because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Be glorified by those you deliver today in Jesus' name. Amen. God's blessing on you. See you tonight, 6 o'clock.